Welcome to Empowerment Radio. My name is Dr. Friedman, and I'm so glad that you decided to join me. Empowerment Radio is about giving you the insights, tools, and solutions to address some of the most challenging aspects of our daily lives. So sit back, relax, and empower yourself. Welcome back to Empowerment Radio. I'm here with Maurice Benar, and we are talking about his book, Nothing General About It. Uh, and before the break, I just asked him whether it was challenging for him to talk about his mental health issues, his bipolar disorder, when he had been playing a role of a gangster, uh, a mob leader in uh, Sunny Corintos in General Hospital. And, you know, when you play something for 25 years, uh, Maurice, I'm pretty sure it has also an impact on you. It's kind of imprinting on you. So how was that coming out and saying, by the way, I do struggle? Was that hard? Uh, it's, it's, it's not been all that hard because I'm, I'm such an open all the time and I'm always talking about my, my everything that's happened to me. But there, it is difficult when you're playing certain, it's, there are some times where things get too deep as the character. Like my father on the show has Alzheimer's and there are some times that I do it and I just, it's too much. And I say to myself, I don't want to do this anymore. But it I know it reminds you too much thing. of your own father. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of my own father. It's it's just it hits these these places inside me that I don't want to be hit. Mm -hmm. And um, but it's my job, so I gotta you know get up tomorrow. Uh, I think the only time that I would say it's scary that I've been really scared is when I haven't, you know, I'm having an anxiety and I have to go in and act. That's scary. So Because that kind yeah. of, I'm out of control there, but I do it. Right. Because you got to overpower it and you do it. Yeah. And I've, I've gone in there, Like after my, when I first started, I, you know, in my book, I quit after three weeks and I had a nervous breakdown. And I had to go back a week and a half later to work. And I had nothing. I had nothing. I was scared. I was, but you know what? I did it. And that's what, that's something I do have in me. No matter how hard something is, I can still perform. And isn't that Thank something that. that, you know, I, I feel like you had many situations probably where you were brought to your knees and somehow you got up and you did it anyhow. I mean, you had in your acting career situations where you felt like I cannot play that role. Like I think the gaudy role was challenging or people didn't believe in you and oh, yeah. you did it anyhow. So how did you find that strength? I mean, you know, it's like because you have been seeing yourself often as someone also who I'm struggling with, you know, my, my ups and downs with the bipolar, I'm struggling with anxiety, but somehow you don't identify yourself totally with that because you are not letting yourself be stopped or paralyzed by these challenges. So there is something really strong inside of you. How do you tap into that strength? Uh, some of it's God, obviously. You know, you, you just, and, and you just do a lot of praying. But the John Gotti role, that was the most difficult thing I've ever done. Hmm. And acting, because, you know, the producer hated my guts. <laughs> Do you know why? Because she didn't want me for the role. So she treated me horribly. <laughs> and, but, you know, oddly enough, it was really difficult, but I didn't have anxiety. It's, it's almost, because that, I should have had anxiety during that period but didn't have anxiety, but I was scared, nervous, like I couldn't do it. And I just kept fighting and fighting and 
fighting and figure out, figure adapting in ways that I could do it, like figuring out how to, what, like I started treating her like I was John Gotti. <laughs> so, so every time I'd see her, I'd be like, you need me for something. <laughs> what do you need me for? <laughs> she was uh, did that scare her? <laughs> that was three weeks ago. I told Paula, my wife, twice, get me on a plane. Let's get out of here. Can't do it. And Paula would say what she always says. Paula's my wife. She'd always say, you are stronger than you know. Yeah. And that kind of gets me through it. Now, the big question is, when do you know that you're stronger than you know? You know, it's like, I think a lot of people feel that, that there is this cheerleader in their corner that always tells them, you can do it. And, you know, why is it so hard for us to then say, okay, you have been telling me this a thousand times, I know it myself. So do you think there is something inside of you that you know better maybe than ever before that you can do it? I'm just going to repeat the question. Uh, so, okay. you know, we all have these kind of cheerleaders in our corners that are saying, yes, you can do it. I believe in you. I mean, when we're lucky, we have those cheerleaders uh, because sometimes we don't really have that inside ourselves, that voice. But I'm wondering, like, you know, you and Paula, and I definitely want to talk more about the role that she had been playing in your life. But she has been saying this a thousand times to you before. Yes, you can do it. I believe in you. You're stronger than you think you are. At what point do you think you're going to believe it yourself? Yeah, I, that's a very good question. I think, uh, I think at this point with me, I should be at that place where, well, I'm going to have to tackle that again when I go back to work here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and maybe I shouldn't ask her if... Uh, Maybe I should stop saying that I can't do something. That's what she wants me to do. She wants me to just stop asking why and and stop saying can't hmm. and just do it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's the key. Now she is that's in the, the title key. of the book, basically. I assume when you talk about love, is it mainly the the love that you have for her and that she has for you? Yeah, you know, the beauty, one of the good chapters in the book that I love is uh, when she would never let me pick her up from home. Hmm. And I was wondering, what do you mean? Let me go pick you, no, 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 pick me up after work. Pick me up at the at the corner. <laughs> this went on for three, four months. When you were dating first. Finally, I said, yeah, we were just dating. Finally, I said, I'm going there. I knew her address. And I had a real long coat that was modeling at the time. I, you know, I thought it was cool. And I knock on the door, and this woman, this lady answers. And it was like, I didn't know who this lady was. And I walked in and there was like 12 people in this little house. They're all smoking, doing drugs. And Paula runs out of the, of the kitchen and into her room. And then we, we leave and we get to the car. And I said, well, who the, what's going on over there? She goes, that's my family. They're, they're, they're drug addicts. That's why I didn't want you to come pick me up at the house. Wow. So I said to her, I said, Paula, I said, I don't care if you're rich, poor, I, that, that doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is how I feel about you. I mean, you should be running for me. I just got out of a mental institution and I'm bipolar. And then she looked at me and she said, I don't care. And that's how it all began. Wow. So you beautiful. didn't judge her, yeah. she didn't judge you. No, no. But what do you think is a secret that kept you together since now, how many years, 30 something? 
over 30 years? Um, I think it's, uh, I think it's just deep love Mm -hmm. that there's no way I could live without her. And she feels the same way with me. And we've always had that. And we're good together as companions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's been, we, we communicate well. We don't really fight a lot. Um, yeah, all those things. But do you have a feeling also that there was a lot that she had just to forgive you and uh, at some point just to never give up hope that especially at the early times when you were struggling and when there were these setbacks for you and, and I think there were times when you, like you said in the book, even scared her and somehow she never stopped believing in you. Do you think that's also, you know, just I'm thinking about all the other couples out there, like the person that was writing you after the Instagram, that, uh, you know, understanding the spouse better, understanding that there is maybe a solution or hope, understanding their struggles and not taking it so personally and seeing that there is another side. Do you think these are all things that Paula has been going through and uh, probably would agree with that that is something that yeah helped her. yeah the, you know i think as far as when i scared her and she always uh says and i guess it makes sense it, it really wasn't him he was you know, i could see in his face he was a different in his eyes it, or like when he was going through a, a, a breakdown, it wasn't him. So that's what kept her. I don't think Paula's too strong to stay with a man to treat her like that, who's not mentally ill. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't think she could do that. But yeah. being mentally ill, she knew that I just needed help, and that's mm-hmm. the beauty of it. That's yeah. the beauty of it. Yeah. But I mean, I think also for her, it uh, is something that she probably has been able to see, you know, that part of you that is the illness, but also the part of you that is the person that she loves, who is, um, you know, strong and uh, and caring and uh, compassionate and also completely accepting of her. So that is uh, probably a secret that you both have been uh, you know, sharing with each other, just to really focus on what's good and what's lovable and and have compassion maybe for the other side that you were struggling with. Because, you know, in, in your book, you write that sometimes it was like going through hell, this highway through hell. And and I just wonder what was one of the the most difficult times for you? You know, what is it where you really felt like, you know, I don't know if I can make it. Was that when you were uh, in the hospital or what, what was a time for you that you really feel like, yeah, I, my mental state brought me to my knees. Oh, well, that was in the hospital for, for damn sure. The only thing that kept me alive, I think in the hospital that I was so drug up that I didn't, I couldn't really, I didn't, it was kind of not functioning because of the drugs. But when I went home, and got into major depression for like seven, eight months. That was, that was about, I think I was on my knees and I was praying to God. Actually, I was swearing to God, wondering why he would do this to me. I'm not, why do, why do I deserve this? Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that was a, I don't know how I did it because at least now I have Paula and my kids, right? Mm-hmm. Then I had my mom and dad and they were incredible, but they would go to work from seven o'clock in the morning till they come home at 4.30. So I was alone. Alone with your know. thoughts, That's alone with your feelings or? Oh, yes. I mean, I, I didn't have nobody, mm-hmm. no, just me in a big house just walking around with my my negative thoughts and mm-hmm. 
I weighed 129 pounds. It was it was tough. That was probably the toughest. Yeah. But I've had other times that were tough also, but not like that. Now, did after the hospital your life change? I mean, was that the time when you got into acting afterwards? Well, I just started getting into acting before they put me into the hospital. Mm -hmm. And then you have to understand, they put me into a county hospital in the beginning. And I was in a room with a guy on my left who looked like he got hit by a semi-truck with a guy in front of me who's uh, eating his toenails <laughs> to another guy on the left. I w and, and I was strapped down from my wrists, my waist to my wow. uh, ankles. And that was, and then they took me out of there real quick because that wasn't a good thing. And then they put me into the mental institution where I could walk around but everybody else was worse than I was. I was like Jack Nicholson in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I was just thinking about <laughs> <That's>, him, yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, that was me. Because, but I don't remember, was he mentally ill at all, Jack Nicholson? I don't think so. I think they put him in because of some other issues he had. But I don't think that he was mentally ill. But it's a long time ago I watched it. Okay. Yeah, okay, well, I, we're not quite the same because I was mentally ill. But I was n normal compared to everybody else. Hmm. So I would, <laughs> they put me in there and it was just, uh, it was, I was going to say right now, I should write a book about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you did. Um, uh, yeah, but yeah. there was some funny stuff that went in there, stuff like that, but, uh, um, you know, all this stuff is very, what it does is it makes me feel, and I hope it makes other people feel, that no matter how impossible you think something is, it's possible. Hmm. Yeah. Because of what, what I've been through in these times, you, you do think you can't do it, but the thing is, you can. You really can, because your mind is very powerful. So, wow. Deep well, here. yeah. I mean, I think that's really the empowering part also of your journey that you, especially at the end of the book, talk about uh, how you have now your routines and how you meditate and how you are visualizing and how certain aspects of your life that you didn't really or of your daily life that you didn't really know about 30 years ago help you to have more of a you know a stable foundation even though you still go certainly through ups and downs and I certainly want to ask you more about that but just going quickly back to because there was one episode your second breakthrough a uh, break uh, down I was pretty uh, fascinated by which is the one where you kind of had like uh, and uh, an awareness of God, and uh, you felt like there was uh, a sense of good and evil fighting. And tell us about that. Well, I, I truly believe that every time you you go through a breakdown, it's God and the devil fighting each other. Hmm. And God usually wins, but there are times, obviously, when the devil wins and you're in trouble. Um. That particular, that, that, you know, it, it, people may, may go, yeah, right. But, you know, I, I, I really saw a light in my room one night and it scared me, but I, I believed it was God and <clears throat> that took me to, you know, <clears throat> every, that whole breakdown was about religion and God. <clears throat> and then one, one story that I love to tell is, I had to go to a church. And when I have to go to a church in this feeling, you got to go. It's, it's, if you don't go, oh no, something's going to happen. So hmm. I went with my mom and Paula to a church and, and it was closed. Locked. Damn. I'm like, I got to get to a church. And then as we're walking away, Monsignor, 
this older Monsignor came up and says, can I help you? I said, Monsignor, listen, I, I need to go inside and pray. He goes, the church is locked. I said, I know, but I'm kind of going through something right now. And they always look at you like, is he on drugs or is he drunk? Or... And he goes, uh, do you take walks? <laughs> I said, no. He goes, all right, let's bring you in. He unlocked the doors. I, my mom and I sat in the third pew. He said, listen, just don't go up to the altar because the alarm's on. I said, all right. So I'm with my mom and we're, we're praying and crying. And, and then I get up and I walk and I walk to the altar and the alarm doesn't go off. Oh. Then my mom walks up, the alarm didn't go off. Now, whether you believe in God or you don't believe in God, you think it's a coincidence or you think it's something spiritual, in my head, for sure, it was God. Mm. So we walked, we walked down and we asked the Monsignor, why didn't the alarm go off? And he goes, oh, they probably forgot to put it on. So there you go. That's all, that's wow. it. Especially in my state of mind, that all becomes something, right? Well, a lot of people say that through their challenges with their emotions uh, that or their minds they became actually more spiritual and some say even more psychic that they become more aware of energies more aware of the presence of god or spirits and uh, and sounds like you have been also becoming maybe more uh, strong in your faith because of it yeah um not as strong as i'd like to be but I do believe in God, always have. And, you know, because people say to me, well, what, what do you mean? Why, why, you know, people that aren't, don't believe in God that. And I say, well, this, how, this life is too difficult. Can't do it alone. Sometimes you need, you need help. <laughs> and that's how I've, you know, gotten help in yeah. my own way. So, you know, it's important. Plus with these, with these stuff, with the anxiety and depression and bipolar, a lot of that goes on in the head there. Well, I always uh, feel like when we have anxiety, especially it's uh, a really good antidote to focus on, to have trust. Uh, not the absence of anxiety is that counts, but really to have trust, trust in yourself that you can handle whatever life brings you. But then if you have that faith, and it's certainly useful and beneficial, also trust in God, trust in a higher power. And uh, when we can really lean into this, then that anxiety and that feeling of powerlessness or out of control just simply dissipates much faster. We have a, a little break. We'll be right back and more with Maurice. Hi, Dr. Friedman here. Thank you for tuning into my YouTube channel. If you're interested in learning more about fear and anxiety, here you'll find guided meditations, webinars, and interviews with some of the most renowned experts in the field of empowerment. Delve into the over 230 videos and more to come every week.